All right. Welcome to the uh, last session of this uh, incredibly interesting meeting. Um, I'm here with my co-chair, Owen Harris, and we'll take you through this uh, session entitled Hot Topics. Um, our first speaker is uh, Aki Shukla. Aki is a uh, Lauder Professor of Ophthalmology at Columbia University. Um, she's also a uh, has a public health degree, and she's going to try to answer a longstanding question um, that's perplexed us all, which is, is diabetes a risk factor for glaucoma? Aki? Thanks very much to the Glaucoma Foundation and the program committee for putting on this wonderful symposium and for the opportunity to participate. The relationship between glaucoma and diabetes remains controversial, and in this presentation, we'll go over some of the studies that have provided evidence for or against this relationship. We'll discuss some common sources of uh, potential pathogenesis for these two conditions, uh, as well as ocular findings, and we'll discuss potential shared treatments between diabetes and glaucoma. Here are my financial disclosures, none of which are considered relevant. 529 million people across the world have diabetes, and this is a condition that has certainly not spared Americans. One out of eight Americans have either diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes, and diabetes is a costly condition. Diabetes-related costs in the U.S. in 2022 uh, exceeded $400 billion, and this amounted to about 12% of healthcare costs overall. A person with diabetes has more outpatient visits, chronic medications, and systemic microvascular complications as compared to someone without diabetes. And diabetes is a condition that's very relevant to ophthalmology as diabetic retinopathy is a leading cause of blindness in working age adults. Is diabetes protective for glaucoma? In 2002, the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study published these results uh, in which uh, they projected baseline factors that may predict conversion from ocular hypertension to primary open angle glaucoma. And they found that diabetes uh, was considered a potential protective factor for this. You can see in the univariate and multivariate uh, hazard ratios, uh, they were less than one. So how do they classify someone as having diabetes? They asked a single question at baseline. Has a doctor ever told you that you have diabetes or sugar in the blood? An affirmative response to this question led to a diagnosis of diabetes, which was found in 191 people. And in comparing groups that did have diabetes versus that did not have diabetes, 8.3% of those that did not have diabetes converted from ocular hypertension to POAG, whereas only 3.1% of those who did have diabetes made this conversion, which is what led to the results discussed in the prior slides that diabetes was the potential protective factor for glaucoma. This was, of course, a surprising finding, as all of the prior studies had found that diabetes was either a risk factor for the development of glaucoma or really had no association with glaucoma at all. This led to some controversy, naturally. And it was thought that trial enrollees were not really representative of the typical diabetic population, as individuals with diabetic retinopathy were excluded from the OATS trial. And a positive history of diabetes was not corroborated by records, blood tests, or medication use. There was also some concern that everyone with diabetes was not actually classified as having diabetes in this study. In response to this, the next year, in February 2003, the OATS organizers began collecting more detailed information on diabetes in their cohort. So they asked that initial question, has a doctor ever told you that you have any of the following conditions, diabetes or sugar in the blood? They also asked whether a doctor or health professional has recommended a special diet to lower your blood sugar and whether you're currently receiving insulin or diabetic pills to lower your blood sugar. These questions had varying degrees of sensitivity and specificity. And they were able to gather many more people who had diabetes. They identified many more people who had diabetes. So the number more than doubled from 191 uh, in the, based on the initial study to 409 participants based on this modified criteria. And based on this criteria, the association between diabetes and glaucoma then was no longer considered significant. You can see this in the univariate and multivariate hazard ratios, all the confidence intervals cross one. This allowed for more complete ascertainment of diabetes, but this was still not perfect as records were not reviewed and blood tests were not done. But finally, these uh, OATS findings did agree with all of the other studies. And we'll just go over some of these briefly. So these are five uh, familiar names of population-based studies. 
Their definitions of glaucoma were quite variable. Three of the five studies included elevated IOP as a definition of glaucoma. Uh, they all looked at the optic nerve. Uh, many of them performed visual fields. Their definition of diabetes and the ascertainment of diabetes was even more variable. This ranged from a personal interview where various questions were asked to uh, various lab tests that were performed. This included fasting, blood glucose, random blood glucose, A1C, abnormal glucose tolerance tests. So really a very wide definition of what was considered diabetes. And it's no surprise then that the outcome of these five studies uh, was very variable. So three of the five found that diabetes was a risk factor for the development of open angle glaucoma, and two of them found that they really didn't have any relationship. So why is there so much heterogeneity? Well, first of all, um, as Dr. Wiggs had mentioned, it is hard to get uh, a consensus on diagnostic criteria for glaucoma. She had said that you know, her department had somehow um, come together and made this diagnostic criteria, but such diagnostic criteria is not totally available, and every glaucoma study will define glaucoma slightly differently. There are also variable measurement standards. Um, you know, same goes for the di diabetes definitions. As you could see, the lab work was uh, very variable, and some people just use questions. And there may be some inherent bias in these studies. Um, you know, population-based studies are less likely to have that ascertainment bias that we sometimes see in our patients out in the wild, in which um, patients with diabetes are more likely to be diagnosed with glaucoma because they're getting more eye exams. Everyone in these studies got eye exams. Um, but these studies may also be biased because elevated IOP was part of their criteria, and diabetics are more likely to have elevated IOP. We'll go into that in a little more detail. So in general, these studies showed some discordant results and really those that were not generalizable. So now on to some commonalities between glaucoma and diabetes. So elevated IOP has been associated with diabetes, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, many of the metabolic syndrome type of conditions. And interestingly, IOP may have a dose-dependent effect um, along with fast, uh, fasting serum glucose. So the highest, higher fasting serum glucose, the higher IOP may be. So the more uncontrolled your diabetes may be, the higher IOP you may have. Potential reasoning behind this includes mechanical properties of the cornea, both cor central corneal thickness as well as corneal hysteresis, and trabecular meshwork dysfunction may be implicated. The aqueous and diabetics may be more uh, hyper, hy may have hyperviscosity or hyperosmolarity, drawing more aqueous into the anterior chamber. And as mentioned previously, diabetics having elevated IOP may predispose them to be categorized as having glaucoma, whether or not they actually have. Vascular dysregulation is known to be a major factor in both diabetes and glaucoma, vascular endothelial dysfunction, as well as vascular, uh, as well as blood flow. And the OCTA uh, has provided us with a powerful tool to be able to study the diabetic uh, retina and peripapillary region. OCTA does demonstrate capillary dropout in the peripapillary vascular network in diabetics uh, versus controls. And perfusion density is seen, a decrease is seen in both diabetics and those with open angle glaucoma. However, importantly, this perfusion density is decreased in the deep retinal layers in diabetic retinopathy, while it's decreased in the superficial layers in open angle glaucoma. So decrease in vascularity, decrease in perfusion in both diabetes and glaucoma. However, the, the layers in which that perfusion density is decreased is different. So potentially pointing to um, different uh, kind of mechanism there. Additionally, the reduction in retinal blood flow that's seen in diabetes and glaucoma um, also shows correlating visual field defects. So if you look at this graph here, as the total retinal blood flow decreases, you can see the visual field mean deviation becomes more negative as well in patients with glaucoma. There's also endothelial cell dysfunction that's seen in both diabetes and glaucoma, and it may be due to the parasite dysfunction, the parasites that surround the capillaries. Um, this is work that's been done by Adriana DiPolo's lab that's shown parasite dysfunction in glaucoma uh, patients. And then loss of parasites is one of the first findings um, that we all learn about in medical school uh, in association with diabetes. 
There are also some local mechanisms that drive retinal vascular reg uh, regulation, including the presence of oxygen, carbon dioxide, endothelin-1, nitric oxide. And just as an example, endothelin-1 can be quite deleterious in reducing perfusion, increasing IOP, and activating astrocytes, which may damage the optic nerve. Glial cell dysfunction and oxidative stress may also be implicated. Both diabetes and glaucoma interrupt retinal and neuronal glial cell metabolism, and glial cell activation and inflammation may lead to the neuropathy and RGC depletion. Ischemia reperfusion injury, of course, is rampant in diabetes, with early diabetes being a hyperperfusion or hypoperfusion state and late diabetes being a hyperperfusion state. And this may disturb endothelial nitric oxide synthase and nitric oxide regulation, oxidative stress, and pro inflammatory reactions. Cellular apoptosis um, can occur uh, related to mitochondrial injury. That's seen in inner retinal neurons and can be seen in diabetes and glaucoma. And there may also be uh, transportation of um, axonal transportation that can be interrupted in diabetes and glaucoma, which can deplete uh, neurotrophic factors like BDNF. Trabecular meshwork dysfunction in diabetes and glaucoma is also seen. Uh, advanced glycation end products in diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, and open angle glaucoma can accumulate in the trabecular meshwork and accelerate the apoptosis of trabecular meshwork cells via nitric oxide. The activation of protein kinase C in these conditions can disturb matrix metalloproteinases, and the presence of TGF beta can impair aqueous outflow. These are photomicrographs of trabecular meshwork cells. And on the left side, you can see a negative culture control without the primary antibody. In the middle, you can see fibronectin immunofluorescence in normal media. And then on the right side, you can see fibronectin immunoreactivity in a media that's enhanced with a hyperglucose solution. And you can see how much more fibronectin is present in that high glucose state. And this may lead to depletion of trabecular meshwork cells. Now shifting gears a little bit to diabetes treatments and their possible association with open angle glaucoma, we'll focus on metformin as well as GLP-1 receptor agonist. Metformin is a drug that we're all familiar with. Uh, the mechanism of action is inhibiting gluconeogenesis in the liver. It acts via pathways that affect inflammation, neurogenesis, longevity. It's said to be sort of a miracle drug in some ways, certainly in the field of diabetes, but it's also been found to have some potential positive effects in glaucoma. So in a study of over 150,000 patients and a large database uh, led by Josh Stein's group, metformin use was associated with a 25% reduced risk of developing open angle glaucoma. And they compared individuals who were on kind of higher doses of metformin, uh, more than 1.11 grams a day, to a group that had never used metformin. Um, and so the comparison was really made between those two groups, but there was a significant risk reduction of developing open angle glaucoma. And they adjusted for A1C, which helped account for glycemic control, and this risk was reduced even with this adjustment. And as we know, metformin is associated, metformin use is associated with lower mortality, decreased cancer risk, decreased cardiovascular disease risk, and extended lifespan independent of, of its effect on diabetes. So really, it might be a drug that has many indications, and even people who are not on diabetes may need to use this drug for all of the other great things that it can do, great things it can potentially do. GLP-1 receptor agonists are drugs that have become more popular recently as uh, they are now becoming popularized for their ability to create weight loss. The mechanism of action of GLP-1 receptor agonists is working via the incretin hormone, which can regulate blood glucose, weight, and satiety. And some common names for these drugs are Ozempic, Manjaro, Wigovi. Um, they decrease levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, improve microglia function, and studies have, uh, in a couple of studies that have been published about these drugs, they've been, they've, it's been found that using GLP-1 um, receptor agonists for more than uh, three years is associated with a 29% risk reduction of glaucoma development. And there have been now multiple studies have shown that have shown this much of a risk reduction or greater than risk, re risk reduction than what was even seen here. It's unclear whether GLP-1 receptor agonists alter glaucoma risk independent of their effect on diabetes. So it's possible if they're used in non-obese individuals, they may have no effect at all, or their effects may be potentiated. So another sort of exciting area to explore. 
Now, coming back to the idea of whether diabetes can be protective for glaucoma, this was an article, an editorial published by Harry Quigley uh, soon after the second set of OATS results were published that said that there really may not be an association between diabetes and glaucoma. And Dr. Quigley stated that diab diabetic patients on average have higher IOPs and higher IOP can make open angle glaucoma more likely, but diabetic patients do not have more open angle glaucoma. So what is that? What is there that's kind of protecting them from developing uh, glaucoma? Well, it may be increased levels of, of VEGF. Uh, we know that VEGF levels are higher in patients with diabetes and this may be protective against retinal neuronal injury because eyes that are treated with anti-VEGF are said to have more RNFL thinning than untreated eyes. He also stated that in early diabetes, episodes of ischemia may fall below the threshold for overt neuronal death, qualifying as sublethal stimuli that serve to precondition the tissue, strengthening its defense against open angle glaucoma. And this concept of preconditioning is not just seen here, it's seen in many different areas in medicine. OCT has also demonstrated higher rim area and higher rim volume in the optic nerve head of POAG patients with diabetes compared to POAG patients without diabetes. And disc hemorrhages are said to be more likely in NTG patients without diabetes than NTG patients with diabetes. So perhaps diabetes has some protective effect. Alterations in connective tissue in diabetes may also be protective for glaucoma. Those with open angle glaucoma and diabetes have thicker prelaminar tissue and neuronal and glial tissue located above the lamina carbosa than those without diabetes. And diabetes is associated with more cross-linking, collagen cross-linking via glycation, which can potentially stiffen the cornea and sclera and reduce IOP, induce stress to the eye wall. There's some opportunity for uh, opportunistic screening. As we know, the Di American Diabetic Association recommends yearly screening diabetic uh, dilated eye exams for diabetics, but glaucoma screening remains controversial based on the recommendations of the United States Preventive Task Force, which states there's insufficient evidence to perform glaucoma screening on the population. A potential association between POAG and diabetes may motivate the development of effective open angle glaucoma screening methods among patients with diabetes alongside their usual diabetic screening. And I'll quickly touch uh, talk about neovascular glaucoma because this talk wouldn't be so practical if we didn't mention this. Everything we've talked about so far has been open angle glaucoma. The neovascular glaucoma is a condition in which uh, ischemic retinal tissue releases uh, VEGF, which diffuses into the AC, leads to vascularization of the iris and angle and the creation of a fibrovascular membrane. That membrane contraction can lead to the formation of PAS, and this leads to uh, an anterior pulling uh, mechanism for, chronic, for angle, secondary angle closure. There are many conditions associated with NVG, diabetes, and retinal vein occlusion being uh, two of the most common. And this condition presents with IO, often with IOP elevation, but certainly with NVI or NVA. And uh, you know the treatment for this is anti-VEGF, so prompt referral to your retina specialist. In conclusion, the evidence for detrimental or beneficial effects of diabetes and open angle glaucoma remains equivocal. Uh, performing analyses using standardized, de standardized definitions of open angle glaucoma and diabetes are, are needed. Anti-diabetic medications may play a neuroprotective role in open angle glaucoma, and it may be worth studying the effects of GLP-1s or uh, metformin. And there is a, a role for opportunistic screening for open angle glaucoma and diabetes. So if we can find an association or even without an association, we really should be screening our diabetic patients for this as well, since they're going to be coming in for an eye exam anyways. Thanks very much.